everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. I'm back. Hey, everybody. <laughs> yes, she is. I'm just so happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, last week was kind of hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. And thank you again for running everything behind the scenes. But um, nice to see you back in front of the camera. Yes, we are excited. I'm excited. Right. You know I'm excited. You know why. I'm excited for this show. <laughs> Yes, class is in session, and we're just going to kind of get right into it. So thank you, everyone, however you're joining us. Class is in session. That's all we have to say. So today, we're joined by two amazing guests talking about perhaps one of the most overlooked slave rebellions in American history. So we have Louisiana native Yael Yaya Gordon, who's a professional historian with over 20 years of experience. She's also a, gen a genealogist specializing in interpreting antebellum history, genetic genealogy, and slave descendant group research in conducting oral history interviews. Yale served as a contributing writer and researcher for the Array Learning Companion, which is called the Queen Sugar 101 Learning Companion, which is available at queensugar101.org which is based on the acclaimed TV series on Oprah Winfrey's own network. John McCusker is a native of New Orleans who worked for over 30 years as a photojournalist, writer, and editor at the Times-Picayune and the New Orleans Advocate. John was part of the team awarded the 2006 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for covering Hurricane Katrina. He is the author of Creole Trombone, Kid Ori in the Early Years of Jazz, and he co-wrote Yokomo, The Native Roots of Mardi Gras Indians, both books published by the University Press of Mississippi. He also founded the 1811, 1811 Kid Ori Historic Museum and the plantation home where the 1811 Delande Rebellion actually began. Welcome to the show, both John and Yaya. Thank you. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. <laughs> How are you two? Wonderful in yourself. Very good. Thank you for having Just us here. So yeah, glad to be with you today. Yes. So glad to have you here. And you are act we're actually interviewing you today on location. Yes. So on location. That, that kind of marks a first for us. So throughout the program, guys, um, you'll be seeing bits and pieces of the museum. So we have the late largest slave rebellion in United States history that started in 1811. Can you just talk about, um, and I guess in researching this, I was kind of amazed at the different backgrounds that the enslaved people came from. And can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes, and thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this a little bit. Um, yes, it is a very community. And in the display you see behind me, uh, what we try to stress is, you know, for so many people, their concept of Africa is just a spot on a map and they don't realize, you know, the United States would fit in there three times. Uh, so, you know, we make a point of saying, you know, in 1718, we have people being kidnapped from the Gambia and, Sen and Senegambia and coming through Gore. But by the time the, the slave trade is outlawed in 1807, for the previous decade, almost all of the folks that are showing up at the plantations along here from the Congo with unanimity. And okay. that is a piece of data that I think is significant. And it's among one of the many things, you know, when you go to look at something in depth, you have questions, but oftentimes the real learning is learning that you've been asking the wrong questions or perhaps <laughs> making the wrong assumptions. Okay. So, you know, the way that we offer the tour here at the museum is we have a film. I have a short film that Wendell Pierce narrated for us. And it offers the basic narrative of the rebellion as it's been told. And then I sort of shift roles back into the journalist that I was for 30 years. And we look at the loose threads on the sweater of that, that is that narrative. And we start pulling at him and seeing what is revealed. And it's been a remarkable journey to discover that. Because hopefully the two of you can clear up some things for me, because I've been reading, in researching for the show, I've been reading a lot of contradictory things. So mm, what I was reading was that the population of, of enslaved people came from places like West Africa, Haiti, 
other parts of the Caribbean, plus people who have already been born enslaved in, in Louisiana. Is, th is that part of it correct or is that false? Well, uh, go ahead. You go first. Um, that's part of it, um, but it's not all full truth. I'll say that because a lot, of, as you mentioned, there's a lot of contradictory information that's out there. And yes, many of these people, people were from the Congo. Many of these people were Creole, Creoles, Louisiana Creoles, having colonial ties to Louisiana. Um, also, we do have that Haitian influence. However, one of the tidbits that's kind of always circulated all the time is that the this, the, the gentleman who started the revolt was of Haitian descent. And there has been actually no evidence that's really ever found that information that, that is very speculative. He is listed in various documents confirmed as a Louisiana Creole. And so even that thought process of having that Haitian influence, there's, again, there's no evidence of such or even what his parents actually were if they were born outside of Louisiana, but this is happening after the Haitian rebellion itself. And so that is one of the biggest pieces of uh, misinformation that, again, it's not saying that it's not true, but there's been no information that actually says that, yes, this is actually confirmed information for this particular gentleman, Charles so on. I would, I would also offer that if you have people that are living in an inhumane situation, they don't need to hear about someone else suffering from inhumanity to strike a blow against it. Agreed? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work that I've done is is to look at the one of the things that has unanimity in all of the writing, whether you're talking about Thrasher or Rasmussen, who tell very different stories, is that they talk about Haiti as being this big in the narrative. Well, it may be that big, but it may not be big, that big as the trigger. See, this is one of the things that bothered me. The Haitian Revolution had been going on 17 years when this revolution happened. They had been an independent nation for six. They also talk about Mardi Gras. Well, Mardi Gras every year. What was different in 1811? And that's what we're digging in on. Okay, so before I get to the next question, the this is basically a multi-part question leading up to the to the big one. So do you think the reason why so much emphasis has been placed on Haiti is the thought that this could actually have just been a homegrown, non-outside influenced rebellion just was, that thought was just anathema to not only just the Louisiana planters, but to all planters throughout the slaveholding South? Absolutely so. As John mentioned, you don't need to necessarily look at someone else's um, their rebellions are um, the undermining of those individuals to take upon you to take upon oneself to start their own. Someone else's suffering doesn't have an effect always on one person, and so uh, individuals are going to get tired. And so, while again, while it may have been an influence, again, we absolutely do not know, and there's no evidence pointing to that necessarily. But these people were indeed fed up, and fed up for various of reasons, and so. It did not necessarily, my belief, take someone else's looking at what they actually did for someone to say, okay, I want to go ahead and rebel. This is what mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and attempt to try to do. And another so nuance, that. if I may, another nuance about Haiti. Understand that when New Orleans doubles in 1810 to 1811, and it's all Haitian refugees, it's not our idea of what a Haitian refugee would be today. These were white slavers. And when they brought their enslaved with them, they're not bringing field hands. They're bringing trusted body men and butlers and cooks. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so what I did not see in the fields of the plantations where this rebellion began was any concentration of, of, of enslaved people that could be traced to San Domingue. See, now, in talking to you this way, it just kind of reinforces to me that as a country, the United States is not good on reflection. Because it, <laughs> it just strikes me that 1811 would have been a really good point for the slaveholding South to take a deep breath, take ownership that it was the system that drove these people to, to do what we're, gonna, what we're gonna talk about in much more detail but that it was the system that was created here that drove the people to do what they did. And it just seems like that was just a completely missed opportunity to say, wait a minute, 
should we continue doing this? Maybe they, that's too far fetched to, for them to have thought about at the time, but to take a look at how they were treating their enslaved people. Well, th that was talked about. Um, there were conversations in the newspapers. Now, you know, mind you, A2 and A7, they ban further slavers coming in from the West Coast. But beyond that, in New Orleans, just becoming part of America and people pouring into New Orleans, there was all this talk about stopping people from coming here with their enslaved people. And then also back to the, the Haitians, the people of color that came here from Haiti, at a certain point, men that were over 25, they wouldn't allow them in. Oh, wow. Okay. So they them in. Wow. Right. So it was, it, they, they ratcheted down on that Haitian immigrant. They ratcheted down on any newcomers as best they could because there was just a gusher of people pouring into the city. And so kind of, added had, you know, you've also got the tension between the sort of noblesse oblige of Washington or Jefferson saying, yeah, well, we're going to have to put this down at some point. Mm -hmm. Going up against the fact that in 1800, you've got the arrival of the cotton gin and less heralded, had been much more important in this area, the evaporator sugar process because both of those things made those crops many times more valuable and profitable than they had been before. Had it not been for that, the slavers very possibly would not have doubled down the way that they did in the coming decades. Got it. And I'm going to ask if this was, because I'm trying to put all the little pieces together before we really dig into it. 1811, my understanding of it is that the old Spanish families and the old French families didn't really like the Americans. Because remember, this isn't that long after this part of the war, part of the country became part of the country. Um, that there was a real tension between the Americans and then the kind of old Creole families. To the point where I understand they were segregated. That's the reason why the French Quarter was called the French Quarter is because the Anglais were on one side of the city and then the old families were on the other that, i learned that today that was like a new revelation did that play into the rebellion's favor the distrust and the dislike between the old families and the new families i can't speak defensively and say that it played a part but i can confirm that there was a lot of tension the the americans <laughs> believed that the french were idiots and they were mongrels and they could not govern themselves. The mm. French thought this the very same. Um, the French were considered, you know, the, the elite, of course, and they actually believed that the Americans were going to come in and stop slavery, but it actually flourished a lot more. But there was their, their own segregated communities, whether that's the French, the Americans, you have the Germans, of course, on because we're, we're, we're in the German coast. But um, I cannot say that that actually led to a part of the rebellion because all of these families that are in this particular area, they're all interrelated and intermarrying. So they're keeping amongst themselves. They didn't necessarily need the outside influence, whatever Governor Claiborne had had going on. Um, they, it, it was just, no matter what, at the end of the day, they're still going to all take up and defend each other when it came to those individuals not getting killed. And I mean the enslavers. Uh, I, would also, I would also stress that a part of this that doesn't get talked about as much is a lot of it was religious bigotry. They hated Catholics. True. Really? Like they like, White, like, black, if you're Catholic, poo. Yeah, it was a lot of it was rooted in, in anti-Catholicism oh, yeah. because remember, mm -hmm. you've got Americans that are coming from the Church of England and the Reformation. A lot of but Protestants. Louisiana, it's all Louisiana, Protestants. Under the Code Noir, that's all French. You, you're having to be French. You're having to baptize individuals. So it's Catholic operated. Louisiana is still, it's still primarily yeah. Catholic. We, are, we have a very, very extremely large Black Catholic community here, probably mm -hmm. the largest. And so it is still that, still that religious, like John mentioned, that religious tension. Remember that, that doesn't... The, reason, the reason the Pope said that you could go and kidnap Sub Saharan Africans and not go to hell was because you were bringing Christendom to them. And however ridiculous that is, all through the colonial period, if you go through the Catholic uh, archival records, people bring their slaves to be baptized. You know, they bring 20 of them at a time. 
And of course, they all the way to New Orleans to St. Louis Cathedral to have him baptized because that was the belief, and that's why they were told by their country and their church, which were one and the same, let's remember, that it was okay, but you had to do that. But again, that's the that's the the weirdness of it because you had the Kingdom of Ndongo, which is where some of the 1619 Africans of Jamestown came from, who had been Christianized. So Portuguese were actually shipping Christians because that's why they had the names like Angelo. They didn't adopt those names when they got here. They already had those names, Pedro, and a lot of it. But I was just um, going to say to Donia, that was one of the reasons why the colony of Maryland was despised because it was a Catholic colony surrounded yeah. by Protestant, uh, Protestant colonies. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I guess I knew that about I knew that about Maryland, but given the fact that Louisiana was such a Catholic place from its origin, to 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 be racist towards them because of that kind of threw me off. That mm. yeah, that just threw me. Yeah, that threw me. <laughs> well, and you know, the British. The, here's let's look at the the glass half full though to the practicing genealogist that's doing African-American genealogy in this era, chef's kiss, because you've got data that's not available to other people. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can tell those stories that you're not just disappearing into 1865, you know, and you can maybe get your family all the way back to, all the way back to Senegal. Mm. Because of Catholic records. Because, because of, of Catholic, Catholic records. <clears throat> All I can say is when it comes to segregation, Britain was world class. So I can imagine they brought all of that, all of the, that ish and all of those isms straight into Louisiana. But I was just curious if that actually was a factor that could have played in the Here's how the it was a factor. It's actually a nuanced thing. And this goes to the root of what we're doing with our research. Going back to sort of Haiti and the other parts of the narrative and so forth as it is, there's this silo of information by people that have specialized in just doing 1811. But then there's the silos of all the fabulous history that's been done on other events in Louisiana. And I am increasingly finding, and I'm finding other scholarship that supports this, that the geopolitical crisis, which was the trigger point for the rebellion beginning and happening when it did, was not Haiti that had been going on for 17 years. It was the West Florida crisis in Louisiana and the months that we went by possibly going to war with Spain. Oh, well, actually, because that would have meant that... completely ignored it. And I'll shoot to the chase here. The West Florida Territory is 15 miles from here, half the distance to New Orleans. Which way you have gone? That makes sense, because if the I'm presuming that the Louisiana militia or army or whoever was going to be conscripted to fight that fight, they were well, gone. They were they were like going here, out towards this Florida. Is why, this is why we push back on the New Orleans thing, because we think Charles may have been a genius, and this is why. Within a few days before the rebellion, he would have seen 150 soldiers march by this plantation on their way to Baton Rouge. Mm. That was most of the standing soldierdom from, Louise, from New Orleans. And they sent them all the way to Baton Rouge to garrison the fort there to keep the Mississippi River open. And the St. John militia got called up. All the guys with guns are 12 hours away. Charles saw that mm. his one of his relations, one of his free relations is in the militia. He'd have seen him get on his horse and ride out of here. Got and it. That is what our discovery, that is just a tip of the discoveries we're making about this rebellion. And people haven't seen it because they couldn't get the eclipse of the obviousness of Haiti out of the way. So before we get to Charles, my last question, the last part of the, the puzzle was at its height, I mean, I know relatively speaking in terms of days, it was a short rebellion, but as, at its height, how many, how many enslaved people were involved? The numbers, 
the numbers have never been com completely confirmed. There are numbers that can range from 70 on up to four or 500. Mm. And that is because we know, while there are records of the tribunals, the trials that would happen at the at plantations, newspapers and, and, and John is a, is a journalist. So he, so he knows how old journalists and editors and newspapers would actually write. And sometimes they editorialize a lot of information, but there's a lot of information they would always leave out, especially for cases like this, when there are insurrections and revolts, no one wants to look or appear as though they're the weak person. So they're not going to be very forthcoming about what happened. And then, and I've seen records and, and news articles that speak literally speak on how um, there was a insurrection that was um, that was stopped, but the slaves were, were they, they, they just had no idea what they were doing. So it made it as though they were that they knew they didn't know any better. You have to remember this is a not only a patriarchal but also a paternalistic type of society as though they need us. They don't know any better. They can't think without us kind of uh, mentality. And so the numbers it it was sometimes really washed out. So that is why around the country you don't hear about revolts such as this the largest revolt in in slave history. We, of course we hear about um, Nat Turner and others, but this is, it, it was covered up so much. There was not a single time when there was an owner that was not sleeping with a gun under his pillow. Guaranteed. Well, that was also in terms of journalism, it was a one day story. Got okay. it. Nat Turner was not. John Brown was not. But the main reason, just in terms of sort of the brick and mortar components, is the penny press wasn't a thing yet. The penny press really takes off in the 1820s, the 1830s, some decades after this. Also okay. remember that there's not another newspaper <laughs> published within a thousand miles of New Orleans. And the earliest publications in other newspapers were uh, six weeks to two months later, because that's how long it took a sailing ship to get from New Orleans to the East Coast. So by then it was a wrap. You know, there, there wasn't a continuing story and you didn't have the wire services and so forth through the telegraph that you would have and have like five competing newspapers in the city the way you would by 1840, 1850, when Nat Turner and, and John Brown are doing their thing. Mm -hmm. OK, so when you you said that the penny press wasn't out there like that, um, it wasn't available until like 1820, 1830. If you have over, let's say the numbers were four to 500 enslaved people, how that was revolting, that was coming back. How could that still be just a one day discussion? You know. Well, I mean, it's a one day story in as much as they killed everybody within about three days. Mm. So at the speed that news traveled back then, by the time you write all that up and get it out, there's nothing else to write. But a thing back on the numbers again, this goes to perception and particularly perception of folks with my paint job. Our observation of the, of the DeLong people on the march was observed by people across the Mississippi River watching from the levee. Now, on the day that this happened, Let's say Charles had 50 guys who were his, his really solid troop, and they're going down the levee. Well, the delay of six hours before they really got on the move after the revolt started, that's another hanging question about the revolt. It, it, all the white people skedaddled. Well, it wasn't like at dawn, all the black folks were going to go back there and dutifully hoe the cane. They wanted to see what was going on. Right. So they'd have been out there maybe walking with them or checking them out. And depending on what time somebody looked over, he could have gone, oh, my God, there's a thousand of them. And there may have only been 50 and everybody else just checking them out. Mm -hmm. Now, to play to your comments about these were very intelligent people. This was a very meticulously planned rebellion. So we have a, at least a couple of hundred of individuals who are involved coming from different backgrounds, speaking different languages. How was that? How how did Charles coordinate it? How did Delonde actually coordinate that? Because that's that's a that's a significant obstacle. Charles is the linchpin in this, because 
what the what's emerging from a study of the people who were living on these various plantations is this was almost certainly begun among the Congo men. The freeborn men who knew that they still had, you know, wives and children and husbands back home somewhere that are still living and breathing that chose liberty or death. And they were immune from what DuBose calls the docility of generational slavery or the risk of docility from generational slavery. I'm glad he says that because that is a cleave. It starts with the Congo people, but it's not going to work without Charles because Charles knows what's beyond a mile from here. Got it. You see what I'm saying? You escape from mm -hmm. a prison, prisoner of war camp, you don't know what's 50 yards beyond the tree line, right? So he was key, and he also knew how the white folks worked and what their schedules were because he had to kowtow to them. And he knew where everybody was and he knew what everybody was doing. Um, so he is the information and plus he's able to travel, which means he can go down to the Piku plantation. He could go down to the Trepanier plantation and talk with some people and say, all right, Tuesday's the night. Got it. And before we get into the timeline of the actual rebellion itself, what was the end game? What was the what was the goal that they hoped to achieve? So, as it stands right now, in well, information that has been say published or put out says they, in their end game was to get to New Orleans, maybe to escape, of, of course, farther. But they were stopped while they had tools. White men had guns. Okay, so they probably could have, of course, gotten farther, but. There is no information on actually what their end game or how far they were trying to go that has been uncovered as of yet right now. They could have very well tried to make just make it strictly to New Orleans and take over because there are, there may have been a, a plethora of free persons of color that lived there and they thought they could take over the city. Mm -hmm. So now I've got a question. If they were headed to New Orleans yeah, or if, if New made, Orleans was... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say... This is the heart of the work that I'm doing because the only evidence they were going to New Orleans was in the coerced testimony of one of the condemned in the show trial. That's Just the only one thing. That is the only place that we get the narrative that that's what they were doing. Nowhere else. Okay, you probably just negated my next question because that was something I wanted to ask you because it didn't make sense to me. It doesn't make if sense they, because they were so smart and that would have been suicide. If they were, if their intention was to take New Orleans, then why were all the white people fleeing to New Orleans? You would have thought that they would have been leaving New Orleans. Moreover, the contemporary news accounts of the time don't say they were headed to New Orleans. So getting back to what I was saying before, in the tension between 1803 and the Louisiana Purchase in 1810, when Spain still controls everything east of New Orleans to the Atlantic Ocean and west of Lake Charles to the Pacific Ocean, and we had been Spanish eight or nine years earlier, and they let it, America know that the, that the Florida parishes were still part of Spain. All through that tension from 1803 to 1810, there was a common belief out in the street, as it were, that the Spanish would free you if you ran away from the Americans to their territory. And it happened again and again. And there are all these letters where Governor Claiborne's writing to the Spanish governor, Casa Calvo, and saying, hey, you know, we got all these guys, they say 20 guys just ran into your territory, you know, and the Spanish would give a few back. But it was, whether it was true or not, it was a common tactic that the Spanish used to cause dissension behind their enemy's line. It may very well be that that got to Charles. And like I said, if Charles had walked out of here and walked 15 miles, he'd have been in Spanish territory. And I just have got to think that there's no way the Spanish weren't involved in this. Indeed, the last line in the letter from General Hampton to Governor Claiborne on the last <coughs> rebellion is, there is no doubt the Spanish were behind this. Are there any letters or reports? Of, of 
correcting narratives. And it's not to negate information. Mm-hmm. As historians, we don't, don't seek to negate things, but, mm-hmm. some, but you have to be able to provide facts and provide actual research mm-hmm. and correct, to correct narratives as opposed to what we have been told and taught. If you don't go dig in these documents and find information and try to make sure that what you've been told is correct or retell the story, then, then we're all going to be completely lost. There's mm-hmm. countless of times that John has gone through these records or he sent me some records and I'm looking at it like, yeah, this this doesn't make sense. And again, it's not to to, to negate anything mm-hmm. that it's to transpired. Illuminate. Right. It's to be able to correct the narrative so we can learn more from it. And well, what yeah. narrative would the slavers want out in 1811? <laughs> Savage Africans kill mm-hmm. whites in their beds or clever Charles DeLong conspires with our enemy to take arms against us. Well, I mean, that you that's know, the they reason. definitely didn't want, if that right. was a story, they definitely wouldn't want that out. Right. I mean, that's the reason why I worded the, the advertising for this particular show the way that I did. One of the biggest... One of the biggest phrases that goes on right now amongst our children is, I am not my ancestor. (laughs) I I can't can't stand that. I I literally cannot stand that phrase, but I understand where they come from because as far as they knew, we allowed everything to happen to us. Because they've been... been... Maybe, no, we are not our ancestors because our ancestors had a lot more resilience and strength and they had had more gunks. You know, about to go because if they so were their ancestors, we they would wouldn't not. be able to take but, what was going on. So but you're going to think, but you got to think that, that you know, yeah. is one of the ancestors from the other side of the flavor chart. Um, one of the things that I'm able to do, this is almost my missionary capacity for my fellow Caucasians, is they come in here not knowing how to feel about this stuff. Sometimes they they just I mean, we don't get the bad types. They're not even going to come here. But even people that are like, you know, your basic latte liberals listen to national public radio, CrossFit, whatever. They want to understand this and they want to have it make sense to them. So in that regard, I tell them. You are not responsible for your ancestors sins unless you take a stake in defending them. Let it go. As long as you don't buy into trying to say, oh, it was the times or, oh, it was this or or any of those shucks, just let it go. You know, I'm sure their dog loved them. You know, you're here because they were there, but you don't have to love them. And it doesn't make you a lesser person for not loving what they did and you know, just say a prayer for him at night and just let it go. You know, first well, of all, I love the fact, I love this, the new, you just gave me a whole new saying, ancestor from another flavor, I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> but to Donia's point, cool, the, reason, <laughs> <laughs> the reason why people say I am not my ancestor is because they believe the white, heavily whitewashed, edited, erased history that they've been fed with no desire to actually do what we're doing, talking about it, trying to dig to get to the truth, which brings me to my next question. Has anyone been in touch with the Spanish art, with the Spanish national archives to see if there are any reports, letters, correspondence coming out of Florida being sent back to Spain going, ooh, Louisiana may be a good kind of weak point for you to check out around 1811. Yeah, well, the the report, uh, the way the chain of command would have worked in the Spanish territory then would have, everything would have goes to Mobile and then, or Pensacola. It's going to go to Havana from there and from Havana to Spain. Here's, and there are records. A lot of the colonial stuff is still here and that's what we're looking at. Uh, But Spain is a mess right now because... Napoleon's taken over Spain and put his brother in charge and he's dethroned the king. So there's all kinds, that's caused all kinds of weird stuff among the former Spanish subjects here. Like, are we still loyal to Spain? Long live Ferdinand. Ferdinand's been deposed. So there are all kinds of wrinkles in a lot of the accounting that otherwise would have been more meticulous, perhaps 
got lost in that. So now you have me thinking that if it weren't for Napoleon, this American history could have gone a completely different way. <laughs> this is absolutely true. Napoleon, that, that even that whole era was is is the most is the pettiest <laughs> of things that were going on at that time. That's why I mean you cannot have American history without Louisiana history. We've we changed so 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 much. So getting information out like this is extremely important because we touch every single state, every surround, not just the surrounding ones, but every state. As far as our governance, we still have our own way of governing. We're still under Napoleonic code here. You know, so it's a lot that is this old, but it's still current for us. And a lot of those business dealings and political dealings, um, they, they, they still trickle down to today. Mm -hmm. So leading into day one of the rebellion, was this, I think I kind of know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask for the benefit of the audience. Was this a drip, drip, drip process? Or was this like, boom, someone snapped their fingers and it's, as Donnie would love to say, it's on and popping. We're doing it today. <laughs> so it was kind of drip, drip, I'll say, because it, it said it started from conversations of someone witnessing conversations from these enslaved individuals, but behind a house or something, having conversations that they were not supposed to be having, but no one knew what was going on in the conversations. But then you have also the insertion of, a woman, someone I always like to th throw a woman into the conversation of this may be why, and now this person is visiting this place and then they're all amongst each other talking. So it gained traction, but there were, um, the, the first inklings of it was was was, test was testimony and information uncovered that said that the, there were some enslaved individuals that were speaking amongst each other, having a gathering, which typically was not permissible at all. So for them to be having that gathering, but then if it's not permissible, why aren't you going to find out what they're gathering about? No one actually did that. So. Uh, also, um, there are there is circumstantial information that may uh, that may be instructive about that, particularly with Charles's biography. Charles is the three things we know about Charles. We know Charles is high yellow. We know that Charles is typically mentioned with the surname DeLong, and he's the HNIC. He's over all the other crews, okay? All of those are going to be consistent with him being the son of the master in the colonial period of this era. His, his uh, father slash master, Jacques DeLong, passes in 1793. Charles shows up on the inventory as a Creole enslaved man. He then is under the authority of Jacques' brother, George, who also lives next door here. George dies in 1800. So at that point, the law widows are in a heck of a fix. Well, you know, these, these plantation owners fancy themselves as the New World's European lords. And they married their children off to each other to cul-de-sac generational wealth. So the best move the DeLong widows have at this point is to marry their daughter, Marceline, to their neighbor's son, Jaber Andre. Every telling of this rebellion has missed that point. And I think it's inescapable that our future rebel leader goes from working for his presumed father to his presumed uncle to three years before the rebellion, working for the guy who's the first guy that dies in that rebellion. It could have been an acrimonious relationship that Charles's confederates helped him act out on. It's also worth noting that a number of in, a number of uh, slavers in this period would put triggers in their wills. Uh, you know, not that make me feel good, free everybody when I die, and nobody actually gets freed. They would actually put triggers so that when so-and-so gets to be 20, they're free. When so-and-so gets to 30, they're free. Well, Charles turned 30 in 1879, 1810, and he still wasn't free. So those are all paths of study and inquiry to try to better understand what his motivations may have been. So even though he was enslaved by his biological blood relation that was not a mitigating factor for him in the least so 
his presumed father because presumed. Yeah, on, right. on record there is no indication um but yeah it's, it's still very presumed and so that's areas that we are behind the scenes you know continuously researching of what actually happened now the others who participated in this actual rebellion non non-relation again it's very speculative but along the way that it gained traction for others to go in and join and then moving from plantation to plantation. Mm -hmm. But the first blow of that revolt, that one person, that individual starts right here in the room, right behind me. And also remember that the people who initially start the revolt, once other people join it, they may have their own agendas. Correct. They didn't burn this plantation down, but they burned some of the ones down river down. That had to be people they picked up along the way. So can y'all walk around while you're like talking about certain things? Because we want to bring yes. this is yeah, this is our first up. time. <laughs> yes, you know, let me do the video real, cut the video on real quick. So we we'll, we will and John will kind of explain some of what's what's. Do going you have on. this on our screen? Let's see. Cut the camera on. So hold yeah. on. Turn it this way. All right. Yes, we do. Awesome. Are you able to? Yep, everything's mm -hmm. there. Okay, great. So the other question that I had, because it was, um, again, a lot of contradictory information. So Monsieur Andre, I heard he either escaped barely alive. This is the man that they supposedly tried to hack to death in his bed. But then the other accounts, I don't understand how a man who was nearly hacked to death could get out of bed. Exactly. Escape. That exactly. they would allow and that they would allow him to escape. I mean, again, right. this was meticulously planned. Right. Well, that's right. And you found two incongruous things there, and that got me right away until we were able to acquire the Andre family history. And here is their telling. Andre was asleep. And he wakes up after being struck with an axe. Uh. That gives us pause right there. You've got a dozen guys in your room that swing farm implements every day of their life. Your victim is asleep in bed. If they wanted him dead, it's a one and done, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's not dead. Yeah. So clearly the point wasn't to kill Andre. The whole reason that they came in here certainly was they needed information or that he killed him in his bed. And the only reason his son gets killed is because he comes running in here with the sword. Indeed, the only two white men who die in this rebellion both come at the rebels armed. They let Andre go. They let his uh, daughter-in-law uh, go. He let the children go. And their delay allowed all the white people to skedaddle, but they didn't go to any lengths. A lot of the white folks huddled at the Destrehan plantation. Certainly Charles knew they were there. They didn't go burn it down. So it seems so, though, you know, the whole you... idea that they were, this was a bloodlust. I, it just doesn't meet with the data. Which again, it's I made them thinking about your hypothesis about the fact that maybe they just wanted to get to Florida. They weren't interested in getting down to New Orleans and burning every plantation between where they were in New Orleans and their path. That would kind of make sense. They just wanted to get out of Dodge. And if Spanish held territory was 15 miles away, they could do that in a day, probably in a day and a half. Right. Just to Unless get there. they got out on that narrow peninsula and there was an Indian village blocking them. Uh, or there was some other impediment and they couldn't get there. It may also be that the deal was is that they were supposed to seize Andre's armory and join the Spanish. And since the armory wasn't there, the person who was in command of the militia at that time in Andre's absence was Colonel Forche. Well, listen in a heck of a coincidence. The last plantation they got to going down river was Colonel Forche's. Is that the bed that Andre was in? Well, that's the bedroom he was in. That was uh, the bedroom. That's a 1815-era plantation bed, though. Oh, okay. we just lost. Oh, yep, we've got it back. back. So this is, my, this is the lead into my question. So when the militia that was coming out of New Orleans met them... They didn't. Oh, they didn't. No, if you read what the after-action report very closely, they never have an identified target. 
They don't get there until after dark, and they say they see figures walking in the background. Well, you know, that's a born suspect situation. Oh, okay, it's sense. after dark. You know that you've passed the last bunch of white people there are before you get to the rebellion, so anybody's a target, right? So that night, they took a couple of wild shots at some, quote, ill-defined figures. But the next morning, they go there, and they're not there. And that makes sense. What kind of a fool would camp out halfway on a commute knowing there's a massive retaliation coming? This is true. So, so was it just the only was... person that puts law there is that junior officer, Major Durrington. Got and it. remember, he's there with the ragtag remnants of a force that they were able to put together in New Orleans because Claiborne has spread his army out in Baton Rouge and Slidell, and that's all they've got. These weren't the top-of-the-line guys. So that begs the question, how, how was the rebellion overcome at the end? Well, the actual battle takes place at 10 o'clock that morning on the 10th. And what happens is Andre the weather finally clears because it's been raining cats and dogs. The weather finally clears and Andre and his force that have assembled across the river spot uh, Charles about uh, not far from where they started, down by the Bernudi Plantation, which is roughly around where the uh, town of Norco is now. They cross, uh, they attack with 40 to 50 men and it's over in 20 minutes. Uh, Andre himself described it as a slaughter. Uh. Charles and a number of his Confederates go to the swamps, and it's in the coming days that, that everybody is tracked down. And I guess if you want to talk about brutal, inhumane treatment, obviously there was going to be a retaliation, but is it true that once they killed hundreds of the, ensla um, the, the people who rebelled, that they literally lined either the, the the way into New Orleans with their heads. Is that is that true? Or is that an exaggeration? No, it, that's it was actually by orders of Governor Claiborne, mm. and part of that was a pushback on what Andre had done. On the eleventh, the militia finds Charles and a couple of his other lieutenants in the swamp around dawn and they're brought back here to Andrew. And this is, you know, 24 hours after Andrew's watched Charles men kill his son. And they're all executed, but in Charles's case, he is tortured horribly and extensively, which is probably why the next day, Claiborne, in a mild pushback, if you can call this a pushback, says that the condemned are to be shot by the militia at their plantation and decapitated without preceding torture. Like somehow that was better. That that was that was the better option. That that's amazing. So how how many rooms is in the museum? Well, when the house was actually uh, the Andre home, it was this room and the room next door. And I'll, I have a picture of what the house would have looked like. So to the question for Yolanda Schubert, um, that's always still a, a presumption. Um, there's been no information that's been uncovered that actually states that, um, that he would have had actual descendants and some of the persons that, um, that, we, that we initially believed may have been, um, say, a mother to his children. That information is, was, was found to be false. So there has been no DNA information that has uncovered anyone that is related to Charles himself. Like and Shelly Shelley asked the question. As far as, his, as far as descendants for for him. Okay. And, if, and, and then, if, if, if we can ever find out, in fact, that he was related to his enslavers, then that's a whole nother um, type of DNA issue. But as far as descendants, no. Right. And then Shelly asked the question, is there a cemetery on the plantation close to where the revolt began? Yes. And um, we have actually we have we are um, very aware of the cemetery that actually actually here, and we are continuously trying to preserve the cemetery and find out more about individuals who were buried there. Um, it's it's 
in a neighborhood where individuals do live. So of course, in Louisiana, you're gonna be walking on someone, unfortunately. So we need to do a lot more with actual preservation um, and dignity for, for persons who have passed on. But we are still actively working to research those who are buried there to maybe find more of their stories because not only does Charles' story matter, Kidori's story matters, but also the descendants of those who were here in between, they, they matter just as well. So yes, we do have a, a cemetery, it's not an active cemetery, we do have a cemetery and we are c continuously doing research and preservation methods for that particular cemetery. And it's nestled in the middle of the community that still calls itself the Woodland Quarters. Wow. Um, so it's surrounded by, in some cases, descendants of people that live there a century ago. Uh, and there is, it is known in the community that that is the cemetery, the, the ground where it is. Cecilia, <coughs> excuse me, Cecilia Nunez said, did this act of decapitating slaves originate from this? No, people have been decapitated for, for centuries. No, for their decapitation, that was to, to make it a purpose to show others this what will happen to them if they do the same thing. It was... Punishment was not earned, it was given. And so to make sure that others would not follow the same footsteps and the same path, they went they went to the extreme to make sure that everyone got the idea of what was going on. So no, decapitation did not start with this. That's just one of the, the things that, that, that happened for, for this particular instance. There were various other means of punishment for individuals outside of just decapitation. Yeah, I'll point out 30 years before this, the King of France had been decapitated. So, uh, you know, it's- People have been chopping heads for a People have been well, chopping heads for a it's, it's not just an expression. <laughs> I mean, not just the chopping of the head. I'm talking about chopping the head off and then staking it and putting it up, you know. Very, That's very old English. As man. Mm -mm. That's very, as old as man, yeah. yeah. But it was sure. also a very- Stuff like that, yeah. A very, a very British thing to do. Scots, Scottish people, Scottish people did it. Scottish royals did it. English royals did it. It's, it's how they, it's how they dealt with quote unquote traitors, which again, I guess subliminally was sending a message by do, you know, doing it. Well, this there's way. a finality to it as well. You also see this in the far East, you know, yes. when, when the head's cut off, the, you've cut the head off, the, you know, it's finality. Uh -huh. <laughs> was there any kind of, how did this impact slavery in Louisiana and was the impact just isolated to Louisiana in terms of slavery and how slavery was practiced? I don't think it was isolated, but it was isolated because being in Louisiana is almost about as far south as you can go. So where else are they going to sell them besides further down south to say, say, say more to the Caribbean, but they're going to be stuck here. So that was that was already a death threat in itself. So they had to go to extremes like hanging individuals and in, in their, in their deceased bodies in front of various plantations and decapitating them of sorts. Um, but it made the other enslaved people very fearful and realizing that, OK, if they're going to rebel, but find more crafty ways and creative ways to rebel as opposed to just making a revolt and insurrection in that particular manner. So we've always been very, very, very um, brilliant people in learning how to maneuver and work the system. Okay. So we've had to find other ways to, to get and rebel, whether that is undercooking food to make someone sick mm. or, you know, putting fluids in, in different foods or, 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 killing of an owner's pig, things of that sort. So it's, it, it made them more, have to be more brilliant in how they actually did rebellion. But it, it kept them also on the outside looking as though they're behaving because they did not want to be done the same way or even have and, some children sold. And if I may, if you reflect for a moment on the stereotypes that are laid as a yoke on black people. If you turn them around and look at them in the slavery experience, you realize that what that is, is it's all decrying forms of resistance, taking too long to do something, showing up late, can't work the thing right, the tool's broken. That's resistance in slavery. Yes, putting, putting the myth of the happy compliant slave to bed. 
as so to speak. The happy slave was the one that got one over on the mass. Got it. Causing spontaneous abortions because to to not have, continuously have children, it was so many things that they actually did to resist, other than causing insurrections and revolts. Well, guys, we have come up to the time, and once again, Yael, you brought on a man that just really just John. I'm so excited to have you. Oh, this, this was a this was real right. pleasure for me. This is what Sundays are about, talking with folks, you know, well, telling stories and having a conversation. You, you don't know it yet. You, you don't know it yet, but we're gonna have you back. Yeah, because oh, I would love to speak right. to you. I would love we well, both of us would love to speak to you about um Hurricane Katrina and how that was covered and how you covered it. Okay. Oh, I didn't like you your go family. from somebody else's heartache to mine. I mean, it it is it's something to talk about and and people need to understand it and i think it's a lot real. of stuff yeah i don't think people understood the stuff that was actually happening well today. how about you come back and and one day we talk about what the wonderful things that happened around here when these people got the foot of slavery off their neck and we had figures like kid ori amen and amen we want all of it we want arriving it and seeing what happens when you give somebody just a little bit of string just a little bit of breathing room and what they're able to what they're able to do. We want it all. Since Mardi Gras, we cannot leave out John's amazing work with the Mardi Gras Indians. We cannot. Yes. He has done so yeah, we we'll, talk, we'll talk talk about Giacomo about next time. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to say thank you guys for joining us. Um, you guys stay online, don't hang up. But we want to thank everybody for joining us. And since this is Super Bowl Sunday, come the following Sunday, we will actually have a Super Bowl ring. Um sports person on our show and a world championship track runner on our show to talk about African Americans in black in in sports. So um again, thank you for joining thank you for us. Mm-hmm. Thank so. you guys for joining us. Thank you everyone who's who shared the last hour with us. Uh we will see you next Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in all the usual places. And until then, I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. You guys stay on and have a great day and enjoy the game. I hope your team wins. Bye. (laughs) Bye.